right now. Thank you. You got it. Thank you so much. All right, we have that up. If everybody could get their camera up, thank you so much for being here. Again, we have a great group, so I appreciate that. I'm just gonna get a photo of everybody. Hey, Chris, I muted you thinking that I was on mute. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, and everybody can mute too. Although, gosh, I love interaction. That's fantastic. Anytime that you guys um, have something that you'd like to pop and say, you can either raise your hand or just pop in and say it. This is definitely a book club where it's interactive. So thank you so much for being here. First, I want to start by talking a little bit about last week and go ab talk about your homework um, and see how how that went for those of you that were here last week. I wanna talk a little bit about um, one of the main points of conversation is about surrounding yourself with people that you admire, people that bring you up, people that make you think bigger. Um, of course, that goes along with income because again, the saying is always, the five people that you spend the most time with, if you take their income and average it, generally those are the people that you're surrounding with. So one of the pieces of homework that we talked about was kind of taking some notes of the five people um, that you hang around with. I'm not gonna ask for those names. Um, although I'd love to hear some feedback if anybody kind of took that down and maybe realized they're around not the right people. Maybe they need to add people to their inner circle. So you guys give me some feedback. I'd love to, to hear your thoughts on that part of it. Okay, this is Cassie. Oh, go ahead. Okay. Um, I realized that most of the people I hang out with is exactly what my income is. Um, yeah. Uh, and that's including um, my friends and also um, the, my close coworkers, such as Alexia, for example. We're very neck and neck with, with our goals and, and nothing that has a lot to do with it. I love that. Mm -hmm. So Lorena, when you were looking in that, at that, I mean, that's exactly what they say happens. Do you feel like, okay, if I want to be here, is there maybe somebody in your world that you thought, hmm, maybe I need to reach out to them and kind of expand that world? Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because that's exactly what I did. I reached out to one of my great mentors and uh, he's an he's a entrepreneur, he's a business owner, he's retiring in Costa Rica. And I am like, hey, how you doing? <laughs> Can we go out to lunch? <laughs> Beautiful. And how hard was that, Lorena? Oh, super easy. Yes. Super easy. And I love spending time with him because every time I go to lunch with him, I come back full of ideas. Omar can tell you all about it. <laughs> Omar's like, okay, you need to slow down. <laughs> slow down. I love it. Yes. It's like that brain dump sometimes of like, yes. oh my gosh, my world has just been opened. And, and yes. that's kind of a lot of the things that we're going to talk about today. So, right. They were open to it. They probably were, I mean, they, I'm sure they felt great that you were reaching out. And if you said that that was an inspiration. So is that the experience that you had? Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. He actually, he was actually in Costa Rica. He's building his uh, dream home over there. So he's like, oh, you have to see this. And he started sending me pictures. And what do you think I should do here? What do you think I should do there? So it was, it was a really good conversation. Oh my goodness. Okay. Did you tell him that you're going to have to fly over to Costa Rica? Yes, to I totally did that. Yeah. Yes. I'm like, well, you'll be my, my Airbnb wants all of that. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a business expense to me. That's just yes. saying on that. So 100%. <laughs> thank you so much for that feedback, Cassie. Okay, so I, I wrote down my list and I actually did a couple more than five. And I, while I was looking at it and listening, um, I agree with Lorena, the income level is spot on. Like it's right there in the realm of where I've plateaued over the last couple of years. And, um, but one thing that I found that is why I'm still kind of vetting it out is there's some things like personal growth in my faith that I need to um, kind of, I think, hone in on. And I don't want to say fix, but um, work that out first. And one of the people on my list, um, as a business owner, she's there already. But I think my meeting with her, I want it to be more faith based. And then once I can get that, like, where I need to be, I think, then the business conversations, because I've been feeling, I keep saying, oh, there's something, you know, business-wise, I can't figure out why I'm not motivated, why this, why that, and I think it's the faith that needs to be 
kind of restored in order to move forward there first. So for me, it was the financial aspect was spot on with what we've talked about, but I think that, and then that, that took me back to, I wrote down a note when I was looking at the MRE a book, but on page 28, there was something that he said was um, to the effect of, Oh, acknowledge where you are on the continuum continuum of accomplishment. And so I was thinking about that and that's kind of where I think I've been stuck as well. So I've really been pondering those things before I kind of take the next step to make sure I take it purposefully. So that is so incredible because what you did is you kind of took a look at that and then put it into other parts of your life. And let's face it, everything kind of trickles together, right? Energy, um, faith, all of these things kind of come together with your business. So I love that you, you did that. And you guys remember, that's the other thing is, yeah, take a look at this and think of other parts of your life health. If you really want to be healthy, let's face it, that's really difficult when you're surrounding yourself with people that are not healthy and eating chips and dips every night, which by the way, I absolutely love. So yeah, I think it goes into several different parts of our life. If that's generally what happens, if you're with a bunch of negative people, it's very difficult to be the positive one in a group of negative people. So yes, it goes into several, several different aspects. So let me hear from one more. And I, re I realized that I need friends. <laughs> and I work so much that besides my, my circle is actually my kids. I mean, I have adult stepchildren. I have seven kids for those who know um, my family, but I'm with my kids or with my sisters and I'm like the motivator of, of my tribe, but I don't hang out with nobody that I really need. So my circles are empty. So that's going to be my goal to fill. I do listen to podcasts. So we, when we teach in QL, right, like everybody is not always a friend that's right there. So I do listen like to Empire Building. You know, I'm a huge fan of that. But I need to start networking with, with Curtis and Carlene. <laughs> <laughs> and they're here. I see Curtis. Hey, yeah. everybody. Yeah. Well, yeah, I think you'd have a lot of people that would raise their hand to be your friend, Jackie. And one interesting thing about that is the thing is you mentioned you're kind of the leader and you're the one kind of pushing everybody, which also is a huge sense of growth because you're the one that's doing that. And you're right. Now you've got to surround your people that now make your like raise what we call your leadership lid. You be around those people that are leading other people because I know you personally. So I know you're, you're a born leader. And so now it's like, okay, let's take those next steps to get there. And sometimes you're right. We just need friends. We need people to laugh with and cry with and all of those things. And it takes, it's a lot to always be the one who's pushing everybody else it's, it's exhausting, right? Like that's an exhausting thing to always be that person. So thank you so much for sharing. Um, I love that you guys showed up. You did your homework. That's super exciting and motivating for me because I've been so excited by um, this book club. So I, first I wanna thank you for being here. I really truly hope you stick with it. For those of you that are joining us a little late. I do have that tracking spreadsheet. So I'm just making sure I will be sharing that with all of you. I'm going to take an extra picture because we had some more people show up. I'll be sharing that with all of you as well as the weekly notes. So that way, if you're driving and that sort of thing, you'll always have that together so we can, can stay on track. So we may not get through the entire to 64 today and that's okay. Um, I want to go ahead and jump right back into it. So we're going to start on page four. 40, if you have your book, it's really about the three L's, which is pretty much the foundation of everything real estate. So who wants to tell me what the three L's are? List listings, leads, and leverage. Yes. Listings, leads, and leverage. Those are the three things that are the foundation of everything real estate. Okay, guys, here's the, the deal is I am um, meeting with agents a lot of times. I hear about all these things that they haven't done yet, or they're not maximizing things like websites, um, brands, business cards, all of those things kind of coming out. And let's actually go back and focus on these things. Let's talk about the number one thing they talk about here, which is leads. 
leads. I love what they say on the bottom of page 40 and then going up to page 41. If you haven't highlighted this, it says to succeed in real estate, you must have client leads. It's that simple. Until you have enough leads to meet or exceed your goals, there is no other issue. This is huge, guys. And I want you to write down other than leads, if you don't have enough leads, everything else you are doing is a distraction. Everything else you're doing, if you don't have enough leads, all that other stuff doesn't matter. Now, not everybody has that issue. We've got people here that have too many leads. And if you see that on Facebook or you hear that, if you don't have enough leads, those are the people you wanna get in contact with A ASAP. Again, website, signage, brand, all of this stuff, until you have enough leads, then everything else is a distraction. Now, there's another part of this book that we're gonna dive deep into. Where am I getting this, these leads? What does that mean by finding leads? This is one reason, guys, so many people get out of the business because they don't realize this is a lead generating, lead nurturing, and relationship business. They think it's showing homes. And that's not it. And that's why a lot of people, they realize it's not the right fit because they don't have any interest in finding leads, talking to people, nurturing people and caring for people. So I want you to keep that in mind because I think that's really, really important as far as leads go. Um, it says here, it has this funny little story about reading an article about the lead generation business and people getting out and said, wait, I'm going to have to call people? You mean people aren't just going to ring my phone and tell me that they need a, a real estate agent. Okay. Be honest. Let's throw it out there. Did anybody, when they first got into this business, thought the phone was going to automatically ring? Yes. I see that. Hey, I'm one of them guys. I, I tell, I tell you guys all the time. I made $0 my first year. I had no idea. I came from the science world and I had no idea how this worked. And I was just waiting. Why, why isn't anybody calling? I've said I'm a real estate agent. Why aren't they calling? Okay, so leads are everything. Of course, having leads and once you've been in the business for a while or sometimes people get their first listing right away, it just depends. Let's talk about listings. How important are listings in the real estate business, guys? How important? Talk to me. The most important. The most important. And tell me why, Jackie. Because listings, um, you could first you could work way more listings than buyers, and listings bring you more business. Yes, you nailed it. So yes, listings. Why are listings so important? If you look on page one, uh, 41, the first sentence there under listings. Listings are the high leverage maximum earning opportunity in our industry. I'm going to read that again. High leverage maximum earning opportunity in our industry. Now, guys, we're not saying buyers, buyers, agents are not important because they absolutely are. Of course, as we're gaining towards that millionaire real estate agent, you're going to have to take listings or of course, maybe you are a great buyer's agent and team builder and you hire a great listing agent. But those listings are pretty much driving the business. I wrote here, they drive the market. You have more control and hey, let's face it. Real estate agents love us some control, right? You get to control your time. You get to control the marketplace and you basically get to control your real estate future because just as Jackie said, you should be getting at least two more pieces of business from every listing that you have. If you're not taking advantage of that, guys, you are throwing business away. If you are not tracking um, every listing that we get on, onto the board, we have a listing up there and we are required to put asterisks every time we get a lead or referral from that listing. We put a little asterisk beside that. We track it because I know I want to get at least five solid leads, which should turn into two pieces of business. And if you're not doing that, 
there could be a tweak or some addition that you're missing. So a lot of times people will go out and do something. They think they need to go do something completely different in their business. Oh, I need to add expireds. I need to hire an ISA. Sometimes guys, the business is there. You're just letting it go. Maybe you're too crazy to really follow up with buyers when they call you in the car and that's a system and that's leverage, which we're going to talk about a little bit. So remember, you should be getting additional pieces from your listings. And I know they're going under contract so incredibly fast, but there are ways to get business from your additional listings. So that's something that we'll talk about a bit more. Any questions or thoughts on listings? Alexi, did you have something? Did you raise your hand? You're kind of freezing. Anyway. I did, but I'm, I was, I guess I was just a little confused because you were saying something about getting the return business on your listings. I was thinking at first it was like as a referral from them, but you're saying actual more traction and actual referrals from just hook up, put your sign in the yard and like, that's it. Yeah. Not that's it. But you know what I mean by that? Like from, I, from having the listing, from your marketing I, efforts. I do. And you picked up on something bigger on the database and referrals. So that's something a little bit different. And that's additional business because that's more referral business. And by the way, speaking of referral, because I want you to take this to take this home is this when you should be asking for referrals at least three times during that listing period, guys, when do you want to be asking for referrals when you take a listing? When should minimal you be asking for referrals from that seller? When something positive happens or the highlight of the transaction, inspection yeah. goes good, appraisal goes good. Thank you, yeah. Sam. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. You nailed it. So yes, we should be asking for those referrals as the as things are going well at the top of their excitement level. Um, Sometimes it's right after the listing, maybe you've staged, maybe you've done something beautiful, you feel like you've knocked it out of the park. That's a great time when they come back and say, oh, I'm so happy, this looks great, thank you so much. That's when you go, hey, I, I'd so appreciate that, you're so very welcome, this is how we work on the so-and-so team. By the way, who else do you know who could use services just like this? Because I love to work with people just like you and so I'm sure you know somebody who might need our services. Okay, you see how I'm asking that? You see how I'm saying I love to work with people just like you? So that's a great way. Yes, after inspections, maybe you went through and negotiated and it was beautiful. Appraisal is another beautiful time because sometimes inspections can be funky. So after that appraisal and it comes in and everybody's happy, woohoo! When we get that clear to close, that's another opportunity. Clear to close, everything's good, yes. And then at the closing table is another great time. However, those of us who've been doing this for a while know it's sometimes very stressful. Maybe there were some last minute things where it went squirrely. So sometimes it is and sometimes it's not. And I'm gonna recommend that you go in there and we actually take our iPad. If they're super happy and it's fun and let's sometimes they have champagne flowing, I have it pulled up where they can write a testimonial right there on my iPad. Like maybe while you're waiting for that paperwork, Cool. Hey, thank you. Because they'll thank you again and again. It's a perfect time to go. You are so welcome. Hey, you know what? Since we're sitting here and we're waiting, can you do me a huge favor? Because you know we we love to work with people just like you, and this is how we get the word out. Because let's face it, people look at testimonials. Can you take like two minutes and throw a testimonial into this? I already have it pulled up for you. That's a great idea to do it right then. I always like I always send it way too late, and they're like they're not as like. Ah! at that moment and I'm like dang I missed the mark <laughs> yes you've got them right you've got them in the room or waiting for the paperwork or whatever it is it's a great time to go ahead and do that you knock it out and then sometimes we'll have like three different ones so Google Facebook Zillow all of those pulled up wherever you want your testimonials we'll have that done another idea is to do drawings for people that do testimonials for every person that does you know, each testimonial, you can do a drawing later down the road. So those are just some ideas um, for your referrals, because I think it's so, so important that you should be getting additional um, business from that. So there you go. There's some side stuff that you can use in your business right away. Um, okay, leverage. Let's talk about leverage, guys. Leverage is really 
the way to get you to the next level when you're ready for it, okay? We all have the same amount of what? Time. Time. Time, right? So a lot of times, how many times have you heard, oh, I don't have enough time. I don't have enough time. I don't have enough time. Is it truly that you don't have enough time or is it that you don't have enough leverage? I want you to think about that. Now, remember, a lot of times when you hear leverage, you think people. Leverage comes in three different forms. As you'll see here on page 43, I'm looking at page 42 and 43 right now. Leverage comes in people, systems, and tools. Now, which one of those three is usually the most important? People. People. Yes, system. It's actually people, people. people. Mm -hmm. If you hire the right people, I'll say yeah. that. People are usually the most important and the highest return on investment, just so you know. So a lot of people will um, buy leads and that kind of stuff when a lot of times it's a person. It's a person that brings you that highest return on investment. And if they're not bringing you a highest return on investment, then you have the wrong person. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, and you should be able to track that. Their goals should be such that it's measurable and you can track that. And this is even your admin, guys. I don't mean just buyers, agents, or salespeople. Even your admin should end up doubling your business because they've leveraged you to the point that you can do your business. So when you hire an admin, let's say you pay them 30,000 to start with, you should be making 60,000 more in GCI at the end of the year because they've leveraged you and that return on investment is there. Okay, so if we look at the top of page 42 where it talks about time and money because this I hear all the time. We've all heard that time is money. Well, that simply isn't true. In fact, it is the, one of the worst mental maps perpetrated on us by an unknowledgeable people. The truth is that time does not always translate into money. Those who work the longest hours are not always those who make the most money. Is that true or untrue? True. Yeah. Yeah, think about it, guys. We know some people who are working 10, 11, 12 hours a day. Are they the ones that are making the most money in this office? You guys know them. Are they the ones making the most money? Right. No, they're not. And we hear this all the time. Oh, okay. Well, I need to throw time at it. I need to throw time at it. It's not always that guys, or I need to throw money at it. It's not always that either. It's sometimes you need to tweak your systems or get better people or get better tools. It's not always throw money at it or time at it. I have people that feel guilty because maybe they'll see somebody who's working till 9, 10, 11 p.m. at night because in our world sometimes that's like a badge of courage. I want you guys to start thinking differently. That isn't always a badge of courage. I mean, yes, it happens, but if you're doing it because you feel like, oh, I'm working so much harder than so-and-so, while the person who's home, who's home at five with their family is going, nope, I just hired somebody to take that and they've now leveraged me to take over this, that, and the other, and I'm getting my return on investment on that person. So think a little bit differently. Maybe it's a, a, a person, maybe it's a system or tool that you need to bring into your world to change your life. And that's not always business people. Sometimes it's personal. Sometimes it's a nanny. Sometimes it's um, a cleaning service. Sometimes it's a dog, go drop your puppy off wherever they need to go. So it's not always a business person that you need. It could be something personal that you need. And I know some of you, I'm looking at you going, yep, we've had this conversation. So yes, we did. <laughs> <laughs> so Marina, you want to speak a little bit to that? Yes, we had a conversation when I had my baby. So I found a nanny and um, also a cleaning lady. So I'm, I'm happy. I would have, I would love to have the, uh, the cleaning lady every week, 
For now, it's every two weeks, but hey, I'll get there. Yes. yes. If I sell more houses, I can, I can, I can afford that. So I'll there hire you a cleaning lady myself. <laughs> oh, yeah. Are you using mine? <laughs> I'll get the number. <laughs> yes. yes. She's using mine too. So I know. Yep. There so, you go. There you go. Yes, nannies, cleaning people, um, cooks, drivers. I mean, I see it all the time, guys. And and there's no shame in that. There's absolutely, you know, no shame in needing assistance to do those things. I think you guys have to think, hey, is this my highest and best use? For those of us that know we stink at cooking and cleaning, we know absolutely not. So I'm gonna I'm gonna pay a professional to do it because they're so much better than me. So I want you to start thinking differently about that. Who in your world or what in your world do you need to hire to maybe leverage you in different types of forms? Okay. So I say something else. Also, yes. I leverage my husband so he could help me. So we work in his list to see if he, he could like uh, help me out <laughs> things that he was doing, like the grass and other stuff. So yes. And it's so true. You can, you can leverage your teenagers, guys. You know how many times I've hired my kids to do postcards and that kind of stuff. They are cheap labor. I'm just saying, they don't know the difference between a buck and 10 I bucks when they're. <laughs> I can't wait. I can't wait to get to that point. Yes. 10 more years. 14 more years. There you go. And, and Debbie, for me, you encouraged me. Uh, I got a bookkeeper. Having a bookkeeper, keep a track of the books. That's like hundred bucks a month. And it's like, oh my goodness, that would have taken me days to figure that out. Yes. And like, oh, 10 minutes. Oh, you have to do this because that's all they do. So bookkeeper yes. was huge for me. Yes. And, and it's so strange because I fought that for a long time. Oh, no, I can do it myself. And man, I took that job back. And tr trust me, the IRS hates me because they were like, I don't know who took over her books, but she should be fired immediately. And so I learned pretty quickly the IRS isn't kidding. And I have no idea what I'm doing. So, yes, hire a professional, especially. Um, when you get to the point, you have to be really smart. And we're going to talk a lot about that this year. So make sure, love you to join the wealth building club because that's a huge part of that as well. If you don't have clarity of what your numbers are and what that looks like, my goodness, how are you running this like a business? So keep that in mind. One of the things I loved here in page 43, it's um, in that first paragraph says the ultimate key to tilting the, the money slash time ratio in your favor will be leverage. Leverage can be divided into three categories, people, systems, and tools. So it talks about those three pillars and these things that we need to be thinking about at all times. And it goes really deep throughout this book. So we're going to dive deep into each one of those things. So I'll, let's go to page 44. So the four stages of growth on the path to a, to a million. We're really going to start to dive deep into that mindset um, you know, that little reel of things that you tell yourself, gosh, you guys, those of you have taken bold, you've heard of the monkey mind and the limiting beliefs, my Tony Robbins fans, like all of these things happening that we have. These are the things that could be stunting you. It may not have anything to do with talent, time, any of those things. It might have to do with right here. So let's take a look at this on page 44. You have the foundational <laughs> model of the millionaire real estate agent. Okay. One thing I want you to do is take note. There is actually a new one after receive. What do we know goes after receive? They've added one since then. Give. Give. Yes. Thank you, Jackie. I knew you'd know that. So give. So there's actually five stages now. Think a million, earn a million, net a million, receive a million, and give a million. Okay, when they say receive, what do they mean by receive? Your profit, meaning whatever you make um, after everything else that you pay. <laughs> so that's your net, Marina. Okay. That's your okay. net. So receive. What does receive mean? That's not profit share, is it? Yes, that is your, no. your, yes. That is the money coming to you from your investments, whether that's real estate or whatever your um, other. So it's your passive income. 
Your receive is your passive income because it's think earn. That means by the way, you guys know we've had two agents here earn that GCI of million. Hey, look at Karina sneaking in. Um, so earn net receive, meaning your passive income coming in and then your give. So all of these you notice are inside the listings leverage and lead. So how you get there, your listings leverage and needs. Again, notice it doesn't say brand, website, any of those things, social media, leads, listings, and leverage, and all of those things in your foundational model. Okay, so I wanna do a little exercise with you because I think this is really important because um, thinking a million is the first one. So let's take a look at that. Okay, I want everybody to clear your mind for a second. And when I say you are a millionaire, you are a millionaire. I want you to tell yourself that two times. You are a millionaire. What's the first thought that pops in your mind? What's the first thing that pops in your mind? Shout it out. Financial freedom. Freedom, yes. Freedom. Freedom. Not yet. <laughs> not yet. Interesting, Carlene. Love that. Yeah. That's not good. <laughs> Curtis is busting you before I get the chance to. I love it. <laughs> Traveling. What was that? Traveling. Traveling. Yes. Ooh, I love that. That's what I thought of. Well, Traveling. Had that, Alexia, too. Michelle. Achievement. Achievement. I love that. What so, I could give to my kids. Ooh, I love that. So legacy, you guys, building. legacy building. Yes. Mm -hmm. So when you guys think a million, I mean, think of these amazing things, right? And you guys are good because we're around a lot of big thinkers, um, which I think is, is huge. But a lot of people, when I say you are a millionaire, maybe that strikes fear. Maybe it, it strikes that not yet. Maybe it strikes that it could never be me. Maybe it thinks, or maybe there's something in your way that you're unable to think of a million. And in fact, sometimes, depending on how people grew up, people think, ooh, that's bad. Ooh, that's going to make me a bad person. Ooh, millionaires are people with money. They're usually jerks, right? Has anybody ever thought like, oh, they're a millionaire. They're probably a jerk. They're probably not nice. I mean, I'm sure we've all had like, oh, I'm guessing they're not friendly. They wouldn't hang out with me. And that's about your financial thermostat, guys. What that means is if there's a time block, if you can't even think that you could truly be a millionaire, it would be very difficult to get you to that earn net receive give. If you can't even think it, then the others become almost impossible. So what we're gonna be talking about and focusing on today is figuring out how to get that out of your head. Because if you can't think it, if you can't imagine it, then these other things are truly, truly impossible. Okay, so financial thermostat. Where does your financial thermostat come from? Where does that, where, do, where does that, what that means, guys, is what you think and how you feel about money. Where like does that- Experiences that you've had with money. Have you gained it? Have you lost it? Have you ever, you know, if you're somebody who comes from something that they've never, you know, minimum wage and things like that, is that something that seems unapproachable, confidence of being able to get there? Yes. Those are definitely things that can change and warp either one way or the other, your financial thermostat. But where does it originate from? Childhood. Yes. Yeah. So it, it originates usually from whoever you grew up with or whoever you spent the most time with like kind of like that pre-programming, right? Whether that's your favorite sports team, political affiliations, all of that stuff usually comes one way or the other from whoever you grew up with. Sometimes it's parents, sometimes it's not. And so whatever you heard your whole life, a lot of times is the way you start your financial thermostat and then life changes. For instance, like my parents were very much like the typical, and we talk about this in KWKC all the time, they were zero risk, zero investment, work your tail off your whole life, retire and you live off retirement. And hopefully 
the government and your retirement will take, take that from you. That's all I knew until I was probably 28, 29 and realized, oh, my goodness, that's really not how you're ever going to get wealthy. I mean, I had no idea. So remember your financial thermostat might be messing around with your mind a little bit. And that's probably something you need to think about. If you can't think it, then you probably have to change your financial thermostat. And I have a book here called Secrets of Millionaire Mindset. The Secrets of Millionaire Mindset is all about your um, feelings around money and, you, and how to think bigger. Okay. All right. So we're jumping into the myths, which really talks about some of the same stuff. So jump ahead to page 47 and 48, where we start getting into myths. This is all about your mindset. Okay. And things that we tell ourselves all the time. Okay, this chapter is really about fear, it says on page 48. The chapter is really about fear, and the source of most of our fears is myth, right? So let's talk about that. When you guys talk to ourselves, right, we tell ourselves certain things, things are going in our mind. What does that look like? Sometimes we can be the toughest on ourselves. Sometimes these things that we say to ourselves are pretty rough, whether we realize it or not. Pay attention. Have you ever paid attention to what those thoughts are? And let me ask you a question. When you're now paying attention and you start really listening to these things you tell yourself, what if your friend said that to you, said those things to you? Would that friend, would that still be a friend? Would you keep them as a friend? And yet you tell yourself those things, yet you say it to yourself. And guess what, guys? One of the most startling um, similarities between a computer and your mind is that they don't know the difference between true fact and what we tell ourselves. They believe everything that we tell them. So in a computer, when we're typing and stuff, do they question us or do they go, okay, I'm gonna try that, right? No, they believe everything we tell them. So does your brain, so does your brain. Sometimes that sounds, you know, airy fairy if you wanna call it, but guys, it's true. Whatever we keep feeding our brain and telling ourselves is truly, truly what we believe, right? So think about these things. That's why you hear things like positive affirmations. It means things like turning off the negative on our social media and kind of turning it to the positive. That's why these things matter is because our brain doesn't know the difference. Did you know? Oh, even TV that you watch, right? If you watch a lot of things with a lot of drama and a lot of trauma, our brain guys doesn't know the difference between a TV show and truly what's happening in our world. So that's why you see, you hear things about depression and, and PTSD and all of these, these things because our brain does not know the difference. We think we know like, oh, it's fake, it's not real, but truly our brain does not know. So I'm curious, I've got a video for you, I'm sure, which, which many, many, many people um, know about, but I think it's exactly um, what we are talking about. So I'm going to play a little video and then we're going to talk about some, some feedback on that. probably be about as good as I was. That's kind of the way it works, you know, and I, I, I was below average. You know, so, whoa. so you'll probably ultimately rank somewhere around there, you know, so really uh, you'll excel at a lot of things, just 
not this. I don't want you out here shooting this ball around all day and night. All right? All right. Okay? All right, go ahead. somebody tell you you can't do something not even me all right you got a dream you got to protect it people can't do something themselves they want to tell you you can't do it you want something go get it Period. All right. How powerful is that? Super powerful. That's my favorite movie. <laughs> Love yeah. it. Yeah. What's your takeaway from that video? I think it's pretty clear. Don't tell yourself you cannot do something. <laughs> you can do it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know. I know my kid has said, oh, I'm going to be a programmer, you know, one of these YouTube people. And I mean, how many times it was like, oh, yeah, no, you're not. And then how many multimillionaire, billionaire <laughs> kids, kids under 20 are out there doing it? I mean, I think we probably say this quite a bit, whether it's to our kids, our husband, friends, whatever that 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 looks like. So I want you to keep that in mind. We know, we believe what we're told. And a lot of times it's what we're telling ourselves, which of course leads us right into the first myth on page 49 on the, I can't do it. I mean, kids say, I can't do it. I think we all say, I can't do it. So top of page 50, um, let's see, I'm gonna go ahead. Uh, let's see, Michelle, you have your book with you? Awesome. Can you read for us, um, starting with the student, can you go ahead and read that through for us? I'm sorry, what? Um, on the top of page 50, can you go ahead and read that for us? Okay. The six best standing to see one high achievement. Myth number one, I can't do it. Truth. Until you try, you can't possibly know what you can or cannot do. Okay. Awesome, yes, that is the myth. And then switch over to page 50, which is the next page, at least in my book. Yes. <laughs> and it starts with student. Go ahead and read that for us. All right. Okay, Gary, do you really think it's realistic to talk to all of us about achieving those levels of success? It doesn't seem very realistic to me. You want me to keep on going? Yep. Okay. Hey, that's a fair question. Do you mind if I ask you a question before I answer? Student, sure. What's your ultimate potential? I'm sorry, I don't follow. What are your limitations? What are you capable of achieving? What is your ceiling? In other words, do you know what your ultimate potential is? Hmm, I never really thought about it. I guess I have no idea. Well, that's an honest answer. And I appreciate that. So here's the point. Nobody knows. And if you don't know what your ultimate potential is, then how can you possibly judge what is realistic? Honestly, what, what good does it do to talk, to, uh, talk about what is realistic when in the end, we don't even know what we're truly capable of achieving? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, guys, and unless you absolutely know your capabilities and limitations, why would you entertain this kind of inner dialogue? Why would you tell yourself you can't? How do you know? How do you know if you've never tried? How do you know what, your, what that is and what you can and can't do? So we get this quite a bit. 
And we have to be really, really careful what we tell other people about what we can and can't do. I'll give you an example. When we have um, new agents come in, one of the biggest questions I'll get is, um, or I, we talk about is making sure that the new agent is prepared not to get a paycheck right away, right? And we do that as not a scare tactic, not on you're not gonna make any money or anything like that, but we wanna make sure that we're setting an agent up for success. We wanna make sure they're prepared because there's nothing worse than an agent coming and now they're so distressed about money, they can't even really think or focus on the business. So it's more just making sure that they're prepared. What we have to be very careful is though, of giving them an expectation of not making money for a particular amount of time. So a lot of times we'll get asked, oh, well, when will I start making money? And you know, then you kind of wanna answer it. So you go, well, like the average agent, usually you'll start getting your first paycheck around that fourth month, like four to six months. What do they hear guys when, when we tell people and new agents that, what do they hear? I need a job. <laughs> yes, maybe this was not the right deal for me. What else? What do they hear when I say, oh, you know, usually it's between that four to six months. What do they hear? I can't go that long without a paycheck. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And they hear, oh, so you're telling me I can't get a paycheck before six months. Because let's face it, they always go to the big. Oh my gosh. I've just told somebody that making your first pay paycheck in 45 days is not realistic. Shame on me for ever telling people that. Now, I wanna make sure you're prepared. However, we have to be really careful about making sure we're not telling somebody or we're telling somebody that they're not gonna make money for six months because what, what do we know is true? What do we you know can do is it true? In 30, you could do it in 30 days. You could have- one is different. Yeah. You could do it in two weeks with a cash buyer. Hey, <laughs> all right. <laughs> yeah, she's throwing it in there. You can make money in two weeks. I don't want to be telling them that either. But however, <laughs> yeah, I mean, you can. Because one of the things that this book tells us in, in the myths is that if it's been done before, then it can be done again and again and again. Okay, not maybe sometimes we need to tweak something or it doesn't start out right. Or some people say, oh, it was luck. Here's the deal is we have to be very careful about setting that expectation of what can and can't be done. And I think that's really, really important for us to pay attention to. Okay. And so looking at the top of page 53, it says, no matter what your circumstances may be at the time, when you set out to achieve something, always begin with the belief that you just might do it. Real estate agents who succeed at high levels understand how debilitating thinking I can't do it can be. They understand that the very first step to discovering their potential is what? Trying. Trying. Yes. You can't know what you're really capable of doing until you try and never give up. I want you to circle or write down, never give up. Because here's, here's the truth. Here's the truth of that situation. It's not a failure unless you give up. I've learned this a lot along the way, especially for those of us who have that fear of failure. It's not a failure unless you give up. Okay, things won't go right. And sometimes like you don't hit the numbers, you hire somebody, it doesn't go well, but it's not a failure until you give up. When you say, nope, I'm done. I'm not doing this anymore. Then maybe it's a failure. That's why you hear fail forward a lot because yeah, that may have not gone the way it was supposed to and next and let's figuring out next. So if you're locked in that mindset of, oh, I screwed that up before, I'm never hiring again. That was a nightmare. You may need to tweak your systems, but you should try again. So has anybody feel like they, they gave up on something and maybe they should try it again or they did, so it didn't go well and you went, you had to do it again. Anybody have that experience? Debbie, I want to tell a, a, a different little quick story. Yes. Talk 
Tony Baroni said that he he had this guy in Lowe's. It was Lowe's or Home Depot, and he was a great sales guy. And he he made him well. He didn't make him, but he encouraged him to take his test. And then he hired him on his team. And he had told him, you know, all right. So how many units you're gonna do? It's his first year in real estate. And the kid did not know better. Yeah. And I think the kid said like, well, I'm gonna do like 50 this year, I guess. And the kid actually thought he was aiming low. And Tony was like, hey, if you're gonna do 50, go for it. But he didn't know better. And I think the kid ended up with like 40 deals his first year, cause he did not know better. So if, if somebody would have fed him and been like, or if they would have told him the average agent did what, eight deals this year, mm -hmm. right? He probably, probably said, oh, I'll do 10 and, and 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 they were four or five, but he was like, I'm gonna do 50, like is 50 enough? And Tony was like, hey, go for it. So it truly <laughs> is your mindset. Yeah, yeah, you know, I, I remember um, when I first started with a coach, they um, told me, oh, you know, so here's the deal. What are your goals? What do you want to do? And I gave him the goals and he said, okay, so here's what I want you to do is I want to make sure you have at least two new appointments a week. Is that something you, you know, you should be able to easily get two new appointments a week, he said. And I was like, okay, that seems kind of low. I mean, gosh, it's a 40 hour job again remember where i came from with big fat goggles and acid in my hand all the time i didn't know any better i'm thinking okay two new appointments will take me what like two hours so absolutely can i do new two new appointments when in reality when you do that math guys with the mrea spreadsheet and workbook if you have two new appointments a week that's basically grossing at least three hundred and fifty thousand dollars. if he would have told me that i probably would have thrown up honestly so the fact that I didn't know any better, to me, two appointments a week seemed totally doable. I had no idea what he would, what he was setting me up for. No idea. So I want you to think about that. Two new appointments a week, one new appointment a day. Can you set one appointment today? Is that what your habits are leading to? Do you have millionaire habits? So if we're making excuses of why things aren't working, why they're not getting traction, all of those things, I want you to ask yourself, would I hire myself today or would I fire myself in my business? You are now CEO of your business. You are admin for those single agents. You are everything in your business. Would you hire yourself today or would you fire yourself today because of your habits? If you don't know what millionaires do, Maybe that's something you need to figure out. There's lots of book in there, like the seven habits of millionaires, things like that. If you don't have millionaire habits and you're not thinking a million, then how the heck are you ever going to get to give a million? Okay. All right. Myth number two on page 53, it can't be done in my market. Now, I don't know if that one's as prevalent because darn, we've had a pretty darn good market. But I have heard it before. I've also heard it with, there's no good investments out there, which is kind of the same as it can't be done in my market, okay? Has anybody ever thought that it can't be done in my market? I can't do that here, investments. Anybody have that thought go through their mind? That's good because we have a pretty darn good market. The one thing I want you to understand is like California, I'll hear that quite a bit. Of course, there are their price ranges maybe starting at a million. And so we'll see these big numbers and I'll hear, oh, well, you know, our average here is what, 265? That can't be done in my market. Oh, yes, it can. There are many agents out there in the luxury that are selling only 1 million and up. So it can be done in your market. So page 54 says, what I want you to realize is that once it has been done, no matter where, it's just a matter of finding out how, how that can be possible in your world. What I want you to realize is that once it has been done, no matter where, it's just a matter of finding out how that can be possible in your world. And they talked a little bit more about this on, if you read the runner story of how, how long it took somebody to break that four minute mile because it had never been done before. So many people kept telling them it can't be done, it can't be done, it can't be done. 
Well, then once somebody finally did it, how quick did it take the second person to do it? Say that again, Jackie. Two months. Two months, guys. The original guy who couldn't do it, somebody else did it after him and he tried for years and because of his mindset, he could not do it. And once the, the guy after him did it, he did it two months later. Yes. And that all came from here, guys. That came from so many people telling him, you can't do it, you can't do it. And maybe himself telling himself it just really wasn't possible. And after somebody did it, two months later. And the point is, guys, there are people who have done it. When this book was written, I want you to keep in mind that teams were very rare and big mega, mega agents and teams were almost non-existent at the time when this book was written. Now we take so much of this for granted because teams are huge now, mega, mega agents and expansion and all of these things people have now done. When this book was written, these things were not here. But what happened is once people actually started doing it and succeeding, it then became the norm. Oh, building a team, absolutely. Okay, so that's what I want you to think in mind. All of those negative thoughts, um, that's going to be your homework. Not only do I want you to read through the rest of the myths here, page 55 through 64, I want you to read those on your own, and we're going to discuss those at the beginning of the next session. We're going to talk about these myths. I want you to really pay attention to things you find yourself saying more than you ever have. And I want you to write them down. Okay. If they're super personal. You don't necessarily have to share them, but I'd love to see when they creep up. I want you to write it down and let's talk about those things. Maybe that you've told yourself, maybe those limiting beliefs that you see. One of the things they do in bold is they put a rubber band around your hand. And every time you get a negative thought, you're supposed to snap it. Okay. So I want you guys to pay attention to that, read those myths. I want you to write those down and see what could possibly be holding you back. Cause then we're going to start talking about how to turn that around, how to turn those thoughts around. All right. It is one Oh one. So we're going to wrap it up. All right. Give me three ahas from today's session. Shout them out for me. Receive Never give up. Never give up. Yes, Curtis. If you don't have leads, if you don't have leads everything else is a distraction. Yes, if you mm -hmm. don't have leads, everything else is a distraction. Yes, Jackie. Receive a million. I never really put that into, like I knew all the other ones, but I really didn't pay attention. Yeah, we just kind of look over the words. Receive a million. Yes, and we're going to talk so much about that this year, guys, as far as getting those five streams of income coming. So I'm sure you've heard that. That's one of our focuses for this year. So yes. Anybody else want to share? Asking for a referral three times in a transaction. Yes. You guys are missing the mark and leads that are just waiting for you with that transaction. Don't just focus on the transaction. Think bigger. All right. Would you hire yourself? Yes. Would you hire yourself? I like that. <laughs> yes. How many of us would fire ourselves? <laughs> Think of what our habits. Did we get up? Did we work out? Did we drink water? Did we like all of these things? What are the millionaire habits? If you would fire yourself, and a lot of times it's a reality check, guys, on what we're truly doing. Stop making the excuses and do the things that you're supposed to be doing. Then you get to do all this fun stuff. All right. All right. Thank you guys so much for showing up. I really appreciate it. We will see you next week. I'll make sure and get those tracking numbers from you and copy you all. So be looking for that. If you don't get it, you all have my cell phone or you should text me and let me know you did not receive it. So thank you guys so much. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Bye. I, I really needed this today. So thank you. You got it. <laughs>